Okay, well, it looks like the numbers have stopped. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, my name is Ben Rhodes. I'm the Senior Vice President with CAMS. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we have Andrew Bateman with us today to, to talk about insurance. Always an exciting topic. And I'll say for me, sometimes very confusing. So um, we will take questions. And so we want you to feel free to use the Q&A option uh, found within the, the Zoom platform. So that is available. You can type those questions and I'll read them at the end of the seminar or the webinar, and we will uh, answer as many questions as we possibly can in the time allotted. Uh, we are also recording this, and we will place uh, the recording on our website. So if you do want to share that information with other board members, it will be available for, for them to see as well. Um, you can go to camsmgt.com under webinars. Uh, we have about 30 different webinars posted, so please feel free to share that link to your friends and other board members. And um, we're really happy to continue to keep doing these. So Andrew, I will turn it over to you. I'll stop sharing my screen and let you get started. You got it. Thank you very much. There, now does everybody see my screen? We do. Excellent. Well, well thank you everybody for participating today in the presentation. I'm Andrew Bateman. I am with TriSure. I am part of the Alera Group. We're the ninth largest, I think, of independent commercial firms in the country. Uh, I am an independent commercial insurance agent, uh, but what makes me different is all I do is work with associations. I insure just over 1,300 associations, uh, mainly in North and South Carolina, but I do have some scattered across the country also. Appreciate being allowed to do this presentation. I do want to just give a brief overview of the insurance industry itself. Uh, for 2023, the insurance market is continuing to be hardening. Hardening means that it is more expensive and more difficult to acquire insurance. Uh, there will be higher premiums. In the nonprofit corporation associations that we're going to be uh, discussing today, you've got to know that there's a perception that the insurance is, is a right. It's not. It is a privilege, and that privilege um, can go away. Attorneys use the word uh, reasonably attainable for insurance. There's no clear definition for it. And if you ask any attorney, they'll each give you a different definition of it. Um, there are very much major contributing factors to why the insurance industry is hardening. Uh, there have been nuclear verdicts, which are verdicts of $10 million or over in damages uh, by juries. Um, there is also private equity funding that is funding litigation against insurance companies. The rising interest rates from in the end of 2022 to 23 were not realized by insurance contracts in 20, beginning of 2022. So insurance companies are catching up in regards to that. Reinsurance has been a problem for a lot of our coastal markets. Um, anywhere on North and South Carolina coast, you understand what the uh, reinsurance me means for your excess market uh, policies. In 2023, there's been a capital shortfall of $25 billion with an increase in demand of over $20 billion. So we've had 25 less in supply with a 20% increase in demand. It's not a good calculation. The other thing is there's been massive natural disasters each year for the last five years. I wish that we were live so I could ask you this question because it's um, uh, the, the question is, is does anybody know what the largest natural disaster, the costliest natural disaster in the United States has been in the last five years? Ben, do you have a guess? I was going to say, is it the fires, fires in California? 
ex- great guess. Um, in 2020, uh, wildfires in Western uh, US, they totaled 31 billion. Great, but that's not the correct answer. Even Hurricane Ian last year is in the range of 50 to 75 billion. Well, the costliest natural disaster in the United States was winter storm Uri that hit the southeast, or excuse me, southwest, mainly in Texas. It had recorded damage of $195 million. So these are things that are causing the insurance industry to harden and premiums to increase. Today, we're going to, um, here, let me forward my slides here. About us, we've already talked about me, the insurance needs of an HOA, and we're going to be talking about the gaps, but it all comes down to making good business decisions for the association. <clears throat> Every board of directors should be getting information from their agent in regards to six, minimally six different types of policies. And the reason why you have your agent get that information is so that in your minutes, you can document that you investigated the coverages and the cost, and then you made a decision, made a decision to have it or not to have it. This isn't me pushing policies, it's pushing information. So you need to be able to at least say, yes, we had this information, but we decided not to buy it because of the cost or the lack of the need for coverages. Because you, every association is different and not every association has the same liability needs. So they don't all need all six, but we will talk about them. We've talked about uh, myself, um, the one designation I just want to make sure that you do know that I am a community insurance and risk management specialist. This is the national designation that I have through CAI. Um, it's it's just a that it shows my dedication to my particular craft that I do. We're going to talk about the six different types of. Uh, of insurance. We're going to go through each one of them individually. I am going to move a little quickly and just bear with that so we have enough time at the end. But for each one that we get into, we are going to talk in depth about a coverage that um, that the association needs to um, pay attention to. And so <clears throat> we have our liability gaps. Um, the most important, this is the general liability for an association. The general liability is what protects the association from lawsuits for two types. It's either a injury allegation or a property allegation that the association is responsible for the injuries or is responsible for causing the property damage. Uh, many times you see it from trees falling, hitting private property, the homeowners sue, or it could be the lack of maintenance on a roof causing interior damage. The, the, the general liability, just got to make sure that you have the maximum amount that you can. We're going to talk about an umbrella later in this, um, in, in this presentation, but the general liability should be attached to the package, or you've got a standalone general liability because you've got an excess property policy. property gaps. We're going to be talking a lot about property, and this is where I want to spend majority of our time today with um, one of the most important things that a board of directors can do when it comes to property insurance is making sure that they have clear and concise governing documents. The governing documents, and it's mainly in the covenants, in the hierarchy of documents for an association, first is articles of incorporation, the second is the governing document, or excuse me, the covenants, then the bylaws, and then rules and regulations down from there. But in the covenants is usually where the governing documents are, and it needs to be clear and concise on what the associations require to ensure. 
It could be just that it's a clubhouse. It could be that it is a townhouse with property. It could be a condominium, a stacked condominium. It could be a high-rise condominium. But no matter what, having clear and concise governing documents is, these are the written contract that the insurance has to follow. In any insurance policies, it never says, well, we're going to insure the interior or the studs out, studs in. It never says that. It says an amount of property at time of claim, the governing documents are going to dictate what is paid out, what is covered in, and what is not covered in. The reason why you need to have clear and concise governing documents is so there's no gaps between what the unit owner is required to carry and what the association carries. The second most important thing that an association can do is have the correct replacement values for the property, whether it's from as simply as an entrance sign to fences, clubhouse, tennis courts, to your townhouse with property, your condominiums, or your condominium or high-rise condominiums. Having the correct Replacement value is the most important thing that a board of directors can do is ensure that it's correct. You can get it from a number of different ways. The most accurate way to get the correct replacement cost is to have an insurance appraisal. I recommend that my associations that have property, townhouses with property or condominiums, get an insurance appraisal. That's where an engineer comes out, assesses the exact building materials, construction, and gives you a per square foot replacement. It's the most accurate. And the reason why is that if it's wrong, you have a fallback to that engineer. This is where we got it from. You can't be held negligent or not doing your fiduciary duty if you've got an insurance appraisal. And it's the most accurate. Um, second is that you can have your insurance agent provide an estimate, and that is the insured to value report. You see it at the bottom there, ITV. It's a estimation done by CoreLogic. CoreLogic is an in industry standard um, provider that will provide a replacement cost estimate based on the zip code, zip code that the property is located in and give you a, re a replacement value. It's an estimate. And what will happen is every insurance agent is required to get from a board a signed statement of values that the board of directors is stating that, that those values are correct. Well, you've got to show as a board of directors where you got those numbers and whether they're accurate or not. The problem is, is that with construction costs over the last number of years, you know, starting into COVID, building costs have, have increased dramatically. In the last years, last year, excuse me, last 12 months with the interest rates rising, that is directly correlated to re, um, and added into the replacement cost also because the contractors are seeing these increased costs and they're passing it on to the replacement cost. We're seeing replacement costs from $185 to $300 per square foot. You need to make sure that you're getting the correct and most accurate for the property values. It is, it is because you never want to be wrong because at time of claim, that insurance policy is only going to pay out what is listed on that policy unless you have um, like a guaranteed replacement cost rider which is something that the board can get also if it is available to the association. It's not available to all associations. It would be based on the age. Many times if the community is 20 years or older, it won't be offered to a guaranteed replacement cost just because of the age. In regards to property, there are going to be some endorsements that you will definitely need to have. Well, agreed value, agreed value is a very important endorsement. This is what suspends the coinsurance 
penalty if the association is not insured to its full replacement value, there could be a coinsurance penalty charged by the association and it's paid for by the association at time of claim. So what it means is that the association still may not get the amount on the written policy. There may be a penalty and they could get 15, 20% less because they hadn't been paying the premiums for the full replacement value. So agreed value is very, very important. And this, there is a cost, a, a cost to have an agreed value. If you don't have it now, get an estimate from your agent to find out how much it is, add it. And I can't recommend it enough to have get agreed value. Of course, blanket coverage is, there's two ways to insure property. It's scheduling it. We're building A, building C, building B, building D. They're all listed and they have a replacement value. Well, a blanket coverage, you're going to add up all of the totals of that replacement. And that total amount can be used in different areas. You know, let's say the replacement cost for building B comes back and it's much higher than originally thought, you know, because replacement values can raise during the 12 month period of the, of the policy. But with a blanket, you can use that money wherever it's needed to replace and rebuild the property. Of course, water sewer backup, very important. Ordinance or law, as buildings get older, during the replacement or during a claim, excuse me, there, this endorsement, comes into effect that if, if this building was built, let's say 30 years ago, so when it was built to today, if there's been any building codes, ordinances, or laws that will affect the rebuilding, you need to have this endorsement. And this endorsement has three parts. If there's damage to the building, but it doesn't destroy the whole building. Part A of this ordinance or law will protect the undamaged portion, portion of the building if there's any special repairs to keep it, you know, a viable and usable portion of the building, or if that part of the building needs to be torn down. The, the undamaged portion of the coverage, uh, coverage A, would pay for that. Second is coverage B. It's an increased cost of debris removal when there's part of that undamaged that needs to be partially removed, taken down. Um, there may be some extra cost in regards to protecting that undamaged uh, portion of the building, but the debris removal pays that extra cost in regards to just truly that, removing the debris from the job site. And part C of the ordinance or law, this is what pays for the increased cost to bring the building back to today's building codes or requirements. If a building code is that you now have to install a fire sprinkler system, or if you have to put in an elevator, or the other things that have changed are. HVAC units have changed, the firewalls have changed, the insulation has changed. There's been many building codes that have changed over the, over the last you know, few decades. If you do not have this endorsement, that will not be paid at time of claim and you'll be paying that out of pocket. With I think I've covered everything in regards to uh, that I wanted to in regards to that. Just remember the two most important things is having clear and concise governing documents so there's no gaps in the insurance and that you have a correct replacement cost for the, for the property and building. <clears throat> Real quick, crime and fidelity. Crime and fidelity is anytime a an association has a professional management. 
CAMS is a great example. They're a professional management company, very well run. They have all of the protections in place where not one employee can write a check or issue invoices. It's, there's, there, there's checks and balances. If you, if an association or if you ever had before a small management company, small management companies, many of them are great. But the problem is, is they don't have the checks and balances or the resources to make sure that there isn't any embezzlement, check fraud, wire fraud, and the crime and fidelity. That's what this policy protects is truly that. It is the text, the operating and reserve accounts from embezzlement and check fraud, wire fraud, social uh, engineering. Now, if anything happens on the management side, well, CAMS and other management companies has insurance to cover that. We're not as worried about that because they, they have that insurance. What this is, this is protects if a board member, committee member, volunteer, or even a spouse takes the information that is, is provided and embezzles, steals. This is where everybody's got a brother-in-law that has a company and they do a fake invoice, um, padding invoices, things like that. That is all illegal, obviously, and that, that would be covered by the crime and fidelity. I also mentioned social engineering. Well, let's say a board member, <clears throat> it, it's basically a board member getting tricked. A board member receives an invoice for, you know, um, Lance, or pine straw, and, and they, they issue it. Yes, you know, send, the, the, send this check to, um, you know, ABC company. Well, in the meantime, ABC is not a real company, but what they've done is they've tricked that board member into approving an invoice and sending it. Many times, of course, it's caught by the management company, but sometimes these criminals are getting very, very smart. So you just want to make sure you have everything covered. Also, just make sure that in your governing documents that you check what amount that you're required to carry of the crime and fidelity, because many times it is covered in there. Umbrella, well, here's, there we go. In umbrella, I highly recommend umbrella. If you have any of the, I call them the four Ps, which is a pool, park, pond, or playground. Any condominium should have an umbrella also. It is the least expensive way to increase the liability coverage. Liability coverage is the general liability. If you have a properly written umbrella, it'll be a standalone umbrella that will cover over the general liability, but also the director's and officer's policy. The director's and officer's policy is what we're gonna, um, we're gonna talk about next. But you want to make sure that you have an umbrella that will cover over both of those the general liability and the directors and officers. <clears throat> Discrimination coverage. This is when this is all right, this is the directors and officers policy. Every association should have a standalone directors and officers policy. This is separate from the general liability and property. If you have an endorsed policy, you are going to have gaps and you do not have the proper coverage. And that's a correct statement right there. So make sure that you have a standalone policy. There are policies that are exactly and only for homeowners association, um, like, a, like the Cancer Society or um, any other nonprofit like a cancer society, they can't buy these types of association uh, directors and officers policy. It's truly only for homeowners association. Discrimination is, is just that. It is a claim that is placed through FHA HUD. Any 
home, any homeowner can log online right now, today, cost them $25, and they can place a discrimination lawsuit against their association. You want to make sure that you have coverage for this because people feel that they're being singled out and they will take action to that against the association. Discrimination is not the most common of directors and officers lawsuits, but it's always the largest. These lawsuits average $80,000 every time. The largest one I've been involved with was $1.2 million and it was over a sprinkler head. The sprinkler head was in common area and they were asked to move it. And so just be aware it does happen. The most common of lawsuits against an association is a non-monetary lawsuit. Well, a non-monetary lawsuit is an association is being sued for action. A unit owner is wanting to be allowed to do something. The number one is through uh, the Architectural Review Committee. Somebody has submitted to install a chain link fence or a fence around their whole property and it's a compound. They want to add in addition, they want to paint their house a certain color because you know they're a, a particular sports fan and they want to paint their house that color. Well, majority of the time it's against the governing documents, but also it doesn't fit the aesthetics and you know the rest of the community. So what does the architectural review committee do? They say no. Well, that unit owner, and I agree, we live in the greatest country in the world, but nobody likes being told no on their personal property. Well, so what they do, they try and sue. And they sue the association, not for dollars, but they're suing to be allowed to do something. They're suing to allow to put in that different fence or the addition or paint their house a certain color. <clears throat> this is definitely the most common type of lawsuits goes through the Architectural Review Committee, but they could be for stopping assessments. It could be for elections. It could be for, you know, ousting a board member. We have had uh, an estoppel where a homeowner stopped a paving project in a community. And it stopped the, the paving immediately when the sheriff delivered it. And it took days for it to be removed. And it was removed, of course, but the paving company had already mobilized and it cost the, the association tens of thousands of dollars to get them mobilized back to finish the paving. And the person just didn't want them to spend the money. So non-monetary is definitely the most common. It is one of the biggest exclusions on endorsed policies. So make sure you have a standalone policy. Failure to procure insurance. Well, we've talked a lot about that already. The association has a duty to maintain, repair, and replace. You also have a duty to get the correct amount of insurance. Failure to procure insurance is a lawsuit that can come against an association and the board of directors for not getting the correct amount of insurance. An example of that is, is that you have a $12 million building and they only have $10 million of coverage. The insurance company is only going to pay $10 million. There's a $2 million shortfall. Association or unit owners sue the board of directors for failure to procure insurance. You definitely need the defense for that. And that comes on the director's officers. <clears throat> Another common one that we see is breach of contract. Well, breach of contract is, you know, landscaping, great industry, no doubt. It's a requirement of almost every association to have a landscaper. Well, a lot of landscapers like to do multiple year contracts and they give you discounts if you do multiple year contracts. They also give you level contracts throughout the year where they'll do, you know, mulch in the spring and they'll do leaves in the, in the fall. But in the winter, well, that's where they don't do as much work. And that's where they make their money is in the, in the winter. But that's also where they get fired the most. So 
what happens is the landscaper, and I'm just using this as an example, the landscaper sues the association for breach of contract or failure to failure to uh, fulfill the contract. The policy will pay for the defense and the defense only. When the judge swings the gavel and says, association, you need to pay for the fulfillment of that contract, what is happening is you're just being required to fulfill that contract. It's, it, you'll have to pay that, out, that part out of pocket, and that's fair. But the defense all the way to the judge decision is covered. And if the judge awards damages, is covered. But what is part that what is not paid is if you are required to fulfill that. <clears throat> Having a, a uh, standalone policy gives us the broadest definition of who is covered. I always use the example, I'm on the board and we just got done with the board meeting and we just decided that we're going to be foreclosing on the Smiths. I go home and I tell my lovely wife, well, my lovely wife couldn't keep a secret to save her life. What does she do when she's out walking the dog? She runs into other neighbors and she starts telling that, oh, we're going to be foreclosing on the Smiths. Well, that could be also a libel and slander that is going against the, the um, fair collection debt uh, processes. My wife could be sued for that also. And I, you know, the association would be sued because that was, that's a release of, of private information because of course the Smiths the next day paid their paid their assessments and they're not going to be lean or foreclosed on anymore. So that's why it's very important to have the broadest coverages available because you want committee members um, covered also. Having a standalone policy where it's not endorsed on the on the property and general liability, it protects the loss runs because if there's a loss on the directors and officers, it doesn't count on that policy. It's completely separate. If you have an endorsed policy in it, or with, this, with the directors and officers on it, the property, general liability can all be affected by the directors and officers loss because it's a loss against the policy and it does go against your loss ratio. Loss ratio just is amount of Premiums paid into the association to the amount of claim dollars paid out. And so we always want to protect our loss runs. I get a lot of questions in regards to workers' compensation. I'm going to cover it all right here, and then I'm going to click through the slides. Hmm. Workers' compensation. This is how I describe it to all of my associations, is that if they do volunteer work and associations do volunteer work for two reasons. They do it A, to be neighborly, but B, to save money and they're doing the work themselves. If the association does not do volunteer work, I do not recommend you carry this, this policy. You do not need it. But if you do volunteer work, and you have volunteer people doing cleanup days, painting the clubhouse, changing light bulbs, doing anything that doesn't require a license because they should not be doing anything that requires a license anyways. <clears throat> Workers' compensation will respond for their injuries while working for the association. The reason why it's not covered on any other policy is because the general liability will exclude all work-related injuries. So this is why the association should carry workers' compensation if they have volunteers. The second reason is this policy would also respond, and I hear this very clearly, is that we recommend that every association only hire insured subcontractors. Because the association could be held liable for injuries of employees working on association property. So just remember that, always hire insured subcontractors. Well, let's say that you've hired a painter and the painter has submitted an insurance uh, certificate and says they have insurance for the you know, next 12 months. Well, the, 
Painter starts working, but the day before they canceled their policy and they canceled it just outright or they didn't pay the premium. But unbeknownst to the association, they have an uninsured subcontractor in the association working for them. <clears throat> if one of the painters gets injured and the industrial commission comes after the association, this workers' compensation policy for volunteers would respond in that way. And the requirement is twofold. You can't hire any uninsured subcontractors. And it was unbeknownst to the association that this contractor had insurance. Then the policy would respond. Otherwise, this would, get, this would be lawsuits against the association. And with injuries, it's the only unlimited liability to the association. There's a bunch of slides here, so just bear with it. Of course, we've got a great picture of ladders on ladders. Here are the two that we talked about is uninsured contractors, and of course, the, um, the volunteers. These are, the, these are claims that we have seen, um, and with the workers' comp policy on for volunteers, there's no deductible on it, and it's unlimited coverage on the injuries. And so just know that. And for associations that do not have employees, if you have employees, you're going to have workers' compensation. And then what you would want to do is add a rider to cover volunteers. But majority of nonprofit corporations that are associations do not have employees. <clears throat> If you do have volunteers, you should get this policy. And, you know, I usually don't throw this out. It's $495 a year. So there it is. And it doesn't matter the number or size, number of volunteers. It doesn't matter the size of the association. $495. Frequently asked questions. We've gone through all of this. Is it required to be in the covenants? <clears throat> From your agent, you should have reasonable expectations to receive premium costs for all of the six policies that we just talked about. We talked about general liability, property, crime and fidelity, DNO, umbrella, and work comp. You should be getting the premiums for each of the endorsements, especially on the property. You need to know how much the ordinance or law costs because it's an itemized charge. Agreed value, water sewer backup, equipment breakdown. These are all important that, that do have costs <clears throat> and that your agent should be providing these each year. If you as the board of directors ever, ever renews a policy without reviewing it with your agent, you as a board of directors just attested that it is all correct. And that is liability that would fall directly on the board of directors. So you don't let your policy just automatically renew every year. Take the time, do your fiduciary duty and look at the policy. Make sure it does have all of the coverages needed. Everything is covered as to the best of your, your ability and you have your agent put all of that in writing and provide that information. Provide the insured divide report. Get an insurance appraisal. But your agent, we, we get paid. We don't get paid by the associations. We get paid by the insurance that we place. So we're, we are compensated to do these things. Second thing is COVID changed the insurance industry and HOA industry forever. <clears throat> what are we doing right now? We're having a Zoom meeting. There is no reason why your agent cannot attend Zoom meetings. The year before COVID, I attended 85 board meetings and I traveled just about 30,000 miles. Since COVID, I have tripled the amount of board meetings that I go to and I drove about 5,000 miles <laughs> last year. And so it's the efficiency is fantastic. Use your board, use your agent as a resource. Use all of your professionals. Use your manager, use your engineer, and use your attorney. 
They are your resources. You need to be able to transfer that risk from the board of directors, either to the insurance company, or you've consulted an engineer, or you've consulted your attorney, and your attorney has put it in writing as an opinion. Use an arborist. An arborist is written that the tree is alive, it's dead, or it needs to be trimmed, it needs fertilization. Those are the things that you've transferred the risk to that arborist, because if that tree falls the next day, that was an act of God. You've done your duty. There's no negligence there. <clears throat> you need to know what the gaps are and exposures are for an association. Here's an example of a gap that is on insurance. And, it's, and it has to do with debris that is not fallen onto covered property. That means in a hurricane or storm, trees that fall and they don't hit covered property, there's no insurance coverage for that. Debris that is blown from the next door condominium onto your condominium property, there's no coverage for that either. <clears throat> you should have a storm cleanup fund and just prepare for hurricanes and other natural disasters, tornadoes, and the other things that affect us mainly here in North and South Carolina. Just have that fund to be ready because those are things that are not covered. Those are gaps and your agent should be able to talk to you about your gaps. If you do not have flood insurance, flood insurance is a huge gap on every policy. Earthquake is another. Get the cost for that also. Even though your community is not in a flood zone, you should be getting, find out how much it costs to get a flood quote. For properties that are not in flood zones, it's less expensive, but it's still, you, should, you need to be getting that business information. Flood covers buildings. Flood policies will not cover um, outdoor property like fences, entrance signs, things like that. Flood covers buildings. Okay. Um, make sure you know what the process is during a claim. What are you to do? And know this before the claim happens on what the process is. Who are you to call and who's going to be the one that's going to respond to you? And find out what your agent's going to do. In our agency, just as an example, we take all claims, and we place the claims. So at, during hurricane times, I am in an area where I am not going to be affected by a hurricane. I will, I will travel away. I have um, different areas that I can go to in the state to get away from. And so, because I need to be available for my association. And associations need to do the same. You need to have a plan that when something happens, how are you going to communicate? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I think that is all that I have, Ben. I can answer any questions. Well, <clears throat> excellent. And a couple of questions have come in. Um, one about renewals, and what what's the time frame that uh, community should expect when receiving a renewal notice? How much in advance will a renewal um, come to a board? Well, just know that, <clears throat> especially for coastal properties, coastal properties, it is getting increasingly difficult to get quotes because of the capacity, because of their fewer and fewer insurance companies are writing on the coast. It takes time. <clears throat> if you're getting it 30 days prior to renewal, that's fantastic. That is a great, great time frame to do it. But it doesn't always happen. And it's getting more and more difficult on the insurance side. The insurance companies won't even look at a renewal prior to 60 days. So they'll start working on it for 30, but it may take 45 days. So you're only a few weeks prior to renewal. And so each association is different. But if you're a single family home, you should be getting at least 30 days prior. Okay. Um, can you shop various brokers without creating a problem for your current broker? Great question. 
in insurance, every insurance company will only issue one quote. So if we have, you know, just, you know, travelers, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, QBE, um, McGowan, they will only issue one quote per insurance company. So if you, you have your broker is looking for insurance and putting it out because like, just an example, I have access to many different brokers plus direct contracts with standard carriers Putting it out may block your agent from doing a good job on shopping that renewal. If you trust your agent, you should let your agent do it and have them show the markets that they went to and the answers that they received. And I, it, this happens all the time, but agents can block the market and stop shopping where another agent has block the market and so sometimes it causes a problem sometimes it doesn't that's you know it's a great question you should shop your policies especially if you don't have confidence in your agent it's time to find an agent that works specifically in it in north and south carolina there are agents that this is all they do and those so, are the agents you should so Andrew, I'll, I'll ask a follow-up question on that one. So, so two agents can't shop, say, the Travelers or, or State Farm or somebody um, that you're writing. So um, if you've, you've written Travelers, do you need to tell a broker, hey, I'm going to try and get other information from other brokers? Or how, do, how does that go about? And then the loss runs, because you do have to request the loss runs most times. And yeah. that's an immediate trigger. <laughs> it, it, it is. And that's fine. Why aren't you communicating clear, clearly with your agent is what I would recommend saying, okay, um, Andrew, what, what markets are you going to? Well, I'm going to go to Travelers, Philadelphia, and I'm going to send it to our RT Specialty, which is you know the nation's largest broker. I'm going to let them shop it. Great. Then... What the board should say, if they're talking to another agent, what markets are you going to go to? We want to make sure that there's no blocking of the market and just have both agents communicate. When, when the loss runs are requested, some associations do look at their loss runs because it's great, huge, valuable information, but it may be a signal to the agent and that's fine. It's, it's, it, it happens every day. Yep. Associations can choose agents and they can do an agent of record to change their existing policies to a different agent. And there's no cost to that. It's just associations pick agents because of their experience and their the, the exposure that they can go get. And so okay. Well, so our master deed requires blanket coverage, but we were told it was hard to get. Uh, we have two condo towers. Um, it costs more than a single entity. Um, is that true? Well, it, if it's being insured as a single entity and there are two separate buildings, two, two separate towers, because it could be, you know, let's say, you know, I don't know the building, but let's say it has a base of the first two or three floors are all the same. And then there's two towers going up on the end that I would consider that would be one single entity. But if it is two separate buildings and they are not attached and anybody looking at it would say, those are two separate buildings and two separate, then they have to be two separate entities and they need to be scheduled. And no matter what, then remember there's blanket and scheduled. They need to be written we use the term scheduled very loosely. So it needs to be itemized on the policy, but they can have blanket coverage. Coverage means that they're both going to be covered under one. And when they say that it's difficult or hard to get, it means probably that it's expensive. But when it comes to insuring it correctly, it's, I'm sorry, you've got to do it. Having it correctly is more important than 
having it incorrectly and it not being covered. Okay. So if CAMS handles all of our financials, bank accounts, pays invoices, and manages the budget, do we still need to get crime and fidelity coverage? Best question. Great question. Two reasons why. A, your governing documents may require it. And if it says you shall carry crime and fidelity, guess what? You shall cover it. (laughs) Second thing is, is no matter what, CAMS takes away 95% of the, of the risk. But every month when you receive those financials, you're going to get the last four digits of the account number. You never get the whole account number. You don't get statements. But on it, there may be the CDs. There may be different investments. They may say where the accounts are and what bank. So let's say I have a... We'll use my lovely wife again. Let's say my lovely wife takes the information and she has the last four digits of the account number and the name of the bank. And she goes out and starts writing fraudulent checks. That had nothing to do with GAMS. That is a board liability. That would not be covered on CAMS policy because CAM didn't do any CAMS didn't do anything wrong. That is a board liability. And that could not, that may not be covered. So that is the, and believe me, I said it hopefully clearly, 95% of the risk is gone, but there is a risk to the board of directors. That is why crime and fidelity is not very expensive. So get the information, make a business decision on whether you need it or not, and get that, and and that's, that's where you talk with an experienced agent talking about your risk and your liability, and then the cost. Because it's not very expensive to insure a million. You know, an example is insuring a million dollars. It's not as as expensive as you think, but it does cover that 5% risk because you don't know. Of course, everybody on the board now is fine and upstanding, no question. But there may have been somebody in the past and you don't know who the next board members are going to be or their lovely spouses. It's, it's, It's part of the risk. And it's always, always blame the spouse, right? Always, always. blame the spouse. <laughs> she, she, oh, hold on, let me look over my shoulder. I don't yeah. think she, <laughs> so. So, can, uh, so can a BMP stormwater pond be insured? Excellent. Another great question. The, the, any pond, and, and let's talk about that. There, there's basically three types of water that is in an association. Please, let's ignore, you know, Lake Norman, we're going to ignore the Atlantic Ocean. We're going to ignore the intercoastal waterway. We're going to talk about inside an association. We have three types of bodies of water that need to be insured. We have a a pond, a farm pond that was there before the association was built. This one is not depth regulated. It could be small, it could be big, but we don't know how deep it is. And so... That is one. Second is is a BMP or a man-made pond that has water in it all the time. Associations put you know fountains in them. That is another. The third is a is a truly a BMP that does a water control device that it rains, it has water in it for two to three days, and then the water drains out. Every one of those need to be insured on your general liability. This is one of the pool park pond or playgrounds before peas because somebody can drown or get hurt and they will sue the association and the general liability is what's designed to defend it. So coming back to the question, can it be insured? Well, majority of them are earthen dams and the earth is not covered. So what? The, the, so the, the dam is not covered, even if it's a concrete structure. The problem is, is that maintenance isn't covered. Earthquake would not be covered. Earth movement, subsidence, erosion, all of the things that would happen to a dam would not be covered. So to answer the question is no, I would say. The other thing with a with it, with a dam is that it fails and there's downstream liability. 
Well, insurance companies are getting wise to this and they're now excluding downstream liability on high risk dams. It is a duty of the association and North Carolina is getting better by hiring more people. Townies are getting better by hiring more people to inspect and making sure that associations are maintaining these water bodies of water so there is less negligence on the association. They have to do the maintenance required by the county or state. So to summarize all of that, uh, stormwater pond is insured for liability, but not property coverage? Correct. Okay. That's um, a long winded, but you summed it up. <laughs> Excellent. So we, we did not do a buy down in our wind driven rain coverage, thinking homeowners HO6 loss assessment would cover the shortfall. I'm starting to hear this isn't necessarily the case. Most HO6 stopped at a 5K, yet shortfall could make up for a 10K <clears throat> special assessment per condo, plus an HO6 might only cover the $1,000 of assessment. Could the board be liable in this? Did that make sense? It did. It, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no question. All right. So we're going to talk about a couple of things in regards to wind-driven rain. Wind-driven rain is an excluded peril on policies, and it needs to be added as an endorsement if you can get it. So our coastal properties, they, they have a property policy based on what amount of wind-driven rain that they can get, okay? Wind-driven rain is just that. It is, there's no physical damage done to the building, but water has been blown around the sills and underneath doors and up under eaves due to high winds. To get this coverage, it is an endorsement and it's called wind-driven rain and there's usually a dollar amount for it, okay? Associations, and I, and I want to talk about, and I'm going to get to the HO6 part because we're going to, I'm going to clarify the loss assessment because I want to make sure we touch that. With the wind and hail coverage, there's usually a percentage deductible on it also. And so that is where the association is self-assuring, insuring that with how the governing documents are written if the association can charge back or assess the unit owners for the deductible. That's how it's done. Well, the HO6 is designed to respond to how those the association charge back the deductible to the unit owners. And how it's done is on the dwelling A property coverage. The dwelling A property coverage is what pays the part of the deductible because just look at it logically is that that deductible amount that's on the master policy that's being charged back to the unit owner is the first amount of property damage. The dwelling A property coverage on the HO6 is designed to respond to that. The loss assessment coverage on the HO6 is, is not for shortfalls of, you know, let's say you need to put in siding in the roof and that there's a special assessment, the raise funds for, you know, doing a capital improvement. Well, that is not paid by loss assessment. The loss assessment is for if there is a shortfall to the either it's, and you've each HO6, Coverage is different. So if you've got an HO6 with, you know, the Hartford or State Farm or Nationwide, each and every loss assessment is different. Some cover only liability. Some may cover property, but not usually. So when I say what the loss assessment means is, let's say there's a $5 million lawsuit against the association, but the association only has $2 million in coverage. There's a $3 million insurance shortfall that is not covered, and it's assessed equally to every unit owner. 
That is considered loss assessment coverage. And that is where the HO6 would respond. Just look at the cost of that loss assessment coverage on forgetting 1,000, 2,500, 5,000, or $10,000 in coverage. It's $30. It's not very much because it is a very, very rare time that that is ever paid. You need to invest in the, and, and I do recommend you carry loss assessment. Don't get me wrong, but you should have as much dwelling A property coverage on your HO6 as you can afford. Yeah, I was going to say property is not something you often see on HO6 policies or maybe minimal amounts. <laughs> so, and, and that is where there's a, your, here's another expectation that you should have from your insurance agent is that have your insurance agent provide a letter that states what the master covers and what the unit owner should be covering. That yep. is a fair request from your insurance agent to ask for that. So that at time of claim, there shouldn't be any question. The unit owner knows what they're gonna be covering, the master knows. And that's also comes back to having clear and concise governing documents because then it'll outline, <laughs> outlay what right. or how the deductible is handled. Well, so I know we have several questions remaining, and I just want to let, for those of yep. you that uh, need to leave, certainly welcome to leave. Um, we're we're hit, hitting the hour mark, so, um, but we'll continue to answer a few of these questions, Andy, as long as you have time. Yeah. So, I'm in. Next one, real simple. What year did the winter storm fury occur? I think <laughs> it was like three or four years ago. It was February 15th through the 20th in 2021. Okay. Um, I may be able to answer this question, um, but I'll, I'll let you take a stab at it first. Are management companies liable for review of the association's insurance coverage? If a manager thinks that they are a insurance person, <laughs> then yes, they can certainly be held liable. That is why it's the association's responsibility to find a good agent to do that for them. Managers should not be doing it. It's just like with me, I don't play an attorney. Managers shouldn't play insurance agents. <laughs> yep, I would agree with that. And you know, we are subject to the duties found within our contract, right? And so the management contract really dictates what we can and can't do. And in most cases, you're gonna see that we're gonna um, you know, help gather information, but we're going to send it over to an expert and send it over to the board to provide the right information. So, um, in a hard market, when companies want to give quotes as few as 15 days before the renewal date, how can a director know they are getting the right deal? The problem is, is that you don't have many choices because in a hard market, in, even in the state of North Carolina, there is probably six to eight companies that will insure anything at the coast. Condominiums in the state of North Carolina, there may be 20, 25 companies and only 20, 25 companies that will insure it. There are not a lineup of companies out there that will insure you know, property for these nonprofit associations. So it's it's getting more and more difficult on the agent and you may not have a choice. You, you need to trust your agent that, hey, here's the list of everywhere we went. We went to every possible market that, that we have available. This is, this is what your renewal is. And so it's not an easy answer, but it, it happens and you've got to trust your agent. Um, attractive nuisances on communities uh, such as beaches or docks um, that are accessed by non-residents. What responsibility do associations have um, as it relates to the types of insurance coverage? Oh, well, that's, that's very much an attorney question, but <laughs> here's the answer is that on your director's and officer's policy, you better have 
you know, noise and, and nuisance coverage in regards to that. You want to have the broadest coverage because the lawsuit's going to come against the board of directors for failure to act. If it's outside the association that you're near a nuisance, nothing to do with the association and the association didn't do anything negligent. That is where you need to get the authorities involved, whether it's the police, whether it's a, you know, the building, um, uh, what is it? When they're not meeting ordinance, you can call the planning board or whatever to, to regulate those. If you can keep it not an association problem, don't let it be an association problem because you're just asking for trouble. But public is the four-letter word for associations. Public is <laughs> biggest liability. Um, so any insurance companies insuring wind-blown rain that is being excluded in a quote um, that we have. So I'm going to guess this might be a condominium on the coast. Um, but wind-blown rain not being included. Yes, there are companies that will do it, but it, <clears throat> there's a reason why you're not, like Travelers excludes wind-driven rain for something in Charlotte, Raleigh. When you go to the coast, it's almost a requirement to have wind-driven rain coverage just because it's, it is a peril that happens all the time. Um, you just got to keep looking. There is coverage for it. Okay, we have berms made with pretty expensive trees, bushes, and other uh, items. Uh, they were made for privacy and noise reduction. Uh, we are in a hurricane-prone area that would damage the berms. Um, when we spent about $170,000 to renovate these berms about two years ago, they are constructed with you know soil and everything else. So is that something that could be insured? It definitely can be insured, but here's the problem that there's very, what it becomes is it becomes outdoor property, okay? And, and I'll give you an example is when an entrance sign is scheduled on, an, on a property policy, it goes from basic perils to special where it's all included. But outdoor property for landscaping will exclude wind, dying, uh, the covered perils that would ever happen to that type of landscaping would be fire and direct physical damage. And direct physical damage means a car hitting it or a truck hitting it, not um, you know, trees falling from wind. Wind would be an excluded peril on that landscape. You can get it. It's not very expensive because there's very few perils that it will cover and it won't cover dead or dying landscaping either. So yes, you can get it covered. There'll be very few perils that will be covered. So I'm gonna ask this next question. I may not have all the right information, but the, the question is what advice would you give an HOA who has hired a disaster recovery service during claims? Oh. <laughs> I, it, it's always great to do it prior to a claim that associations can, can have a written contract with a, you know, a disaster recovery company, restoration company, so that when a you know, natural disaster happens or a tragedy happens, that you're much higher on the list where they're gonna bring their crews to your association first. When you have those disaster recovery ones where they're storm chasers, that is where I would consult your attorney and do your background and due diligence into that investigating these. Um, possibly, you know, you, you what, like Cam says, the most experienced of any management firm on the coast. Bar none. I mean, they're, they've, they've been there forever and they have all the resources. Use your 
manager as a huge resource, but you may want to inquire into a public adjuster also. A public adjuster would be hired by the association to manage the claim and disaster going forward. But remember, you're going to pay upwards of 10% of whatever the claim is. And so they have positives and negatives. Having one that you know prior to a claim, much better because you've interviewed them. You're not in a rush. You're not in a jam. So, so in North Carolina, uh, does a master policy take precedence when damage is caused to a unit by an event in a neighbor's unit? If I submitted my claim to an insurance company, would they say the master policy must cover? Great question. Now, I will assume I'll do. I'll answer the question as broad as I can and, and be as precise. In 1980, October 1st, 1986, the Condominium Act. So, if this is a condominium, it states in the Condominium Act, regardless of what your governing documents say, that the property policy for the association would be primary. <clears throat> if this is a townhome that is not a condominium and there is property damage, there will be a waiver of subrogation. Waiver of subrogation means that, hey, the property damage happened in the unit next door. It came under the wall, through the party wall, and did damage the other unit. It's the same with a condominium also, but in this example. The townhome, it goes to multiple units down the road, down the line. Townhome unit A, where it originated, they'd be responsible for the damage to their units. B would be responsible for damage to their units. If it's a townhome that has property coverage also, the, the townhome property policy would be primary. But there's a waiver of subrogation to keep unit owners from suing each other. It just helps eliminate the lawsuits. You know, he said, she said, well, this is what makes it, helps it primary. Those are governing documents I would have reviewed and have them reviewed immediately so you know at time of claim who's going to be covering what, how is deductible being assessed. Definitely turn to an attorney to help with that. Yeah, and I think there's, you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but your HO6 policy, um, if there is property coverage, um, it sometimes, while there may be a master <laughs> policy that would be first, um, Sometimes the HO6 policy will, will cover that um, if there's property. Yep. And, and all of that caveat is, is that it exceeds the deductible on the master policy. If it doesn't, then it's an association issue to figure out. And you should know the answer there also. Is it going to be the homeowner that's going to be repairing that with their HO6? Or is it going to be a common expense paid by the association? So is the board responsible if a six townhome unit or six unit townhome are required to be self-insured and the board finds that one of the units in the six unit building was not insured properly? Great question. That is where you have to turn to your governing documents to see if there's a requirement in the governing documents for the unit owners to show proof of insurance. If there's not a requirement, you can't make them show that, that they have um, insurance. Unfortunately, if there is a claim and five of the units have insurance and the sixth one does not, in every governing document, there's a duty to repair. And if they're unable to do that repair, then the board's going to have to you know, do the, have a hearing, start the fine process lean and foreclose, and then take that unit back. But that unit has to be repaired because it could cause damage to the other five. And it will drop the property values also, but it's more to protect the property. Okay, last question. And this may be one for both of us. <laughs> so shouldn't CAMS be responsible for a line item um, in the, I guess I'm going to say the line item in the budget, um, but the board has no contact with the insurance agent. Do you understand that question? I think though, I think that was directed to you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I mean, I, I can answer it a 
couple of different ways, but ultimately the board is responsible for everything that goes on within the association. Um, the management company is a vendor of the association, just like your insurance company is a vendor of the association or your landscaper is a vendor of the association. So if the insurance contract or insurance policy changes, um, that would be more of an issue between the board and the insurance agent and insurance company. Um, CAMS is there to help provide recommendations, but we're not the um, ultimate authority when it comes to the insurance policy. So, uh, Andrew, would you disagree? <laughs> no, I would not. It, it definitely needs to, if a board is not communicating with their agent, they need to use that. It doesn't, and, and it, I do see the next question in regards to, you know, small neighborhoods. What you need to do is make sure that you're having your risks uh, assessed. You know, with small neighborhoods, you have common property. You have the entrance sign, mailbox, kiosks, fences, retaining walls. They all need to be insured. And you need to have general liability. You need to have directors and officers insurance because you have the same liability. It doesn't matter the size. <clears throat> it's actually, look at it this way. The insurance for an association, or excuse me, the liability for an association follows your deed. Your deed is what makes you a member of that association. So if there is ever an insurance or a claim or a situation that is not covered by insurance, and it is specially assessed to every homeowners, all the homeowners, and there's not insurance coverage for it, and then you can't afford to pay it, it's going to attach to your deed. You're not going to be able to buy or sell into that until that is settled. And a smaller association has fewer homes to divide that special assessment. So having insurance, even on a small association, is just as important as, as a big association. Okay. <clears throat> well, that was the end of our questions. So, Andrew, thank you very much for um, hosting tonight. And uh, we look forward to the next time. I appreciate it. So, Thank you, everybody, for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Yep. As a reminder, we do record these sessions, and they will be posted on the camsmgt.com website. So if you would like to, again, share this with any of your other board members or uh, watch it again, uh, you can certainly do to do that on uh, the webinar section of the website. So we thank you for your participation, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.